Thank you, for, thank you, Brother Allen, for reading our scriptural text, which came from the book of Revelation. The chapter is 4, and the verses are 1 through 11. I do know that the scripture that was given this morning on the slide was Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. So before I blame somebody else, maybe my PowerPoint slides have, slides have 14. Uh, 1 through 11, but yep, there it is. All right, so it's, <laughs> the scripture is Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. So the right scripture was read this morning. I'd like to thank Brother Allen for reading it. And I'd like to thank Brother Ricky for the songs that he selected, as we will be talking today about the throne of God. The throne of God. What is a throne? Well, a throne, by definition, is a royal chair or seat of dignity. Only the king is allowed to sit on the throne. A throne also can be defined as the office of the one who is supreme. When a person becomes king, it is said that this person ascended to the throne. A throne represents sovereign power. It represents sovereign authority. When an individual addresses a king, whether this king is standing or whether this king is sitting, it is said that this person has addressed the throne. The word throne in our text of Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 through 11, is the Greek word thronos, which literally means a stately seat. However, by implication, it also means power. It also means authority. And it means power and authority as a result of the one who is seated on the throne and where this particular throne is located. Now, it should go without question who is seated on this throne and where this throne is located. But for the sake of emphasis, we need to be overly simplistic and remind everyone in here who is seated on this throne and where this throne is located. Who is the one seated on the throne? Well, the one seated on the throne in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 is God the Father. Now, how do we know this? I thought Jesus was king of kings. I thought Jesus was Lord of lords. How is it that God the Father is the one that is seated on this throne? Well, there's a couple of clues that lead us to this conclusion. We know this because Revelation went into great depth and detail to describe Jesus in apocalyptic language as we look at the first three chapters of Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 2, and Revelation chapter 3, and even when we jump to Revelation chapter 5, we receive detail, apocalyptic language and description of who Jesus is and how he is described. But when we come to Revelation chapter 4, we see that the one sitting on the throne is not used is not described with such language. He is only described as having the appearance of Jasper and having the appearance of Carnelian. See, human features, my brothers and sisters, are not used to describe the one sitting on the throne. Only attributes are used to describe his surpassing brightness and his surpassing glory. This is the only way man knows how to describe God because he is described by his glory. What does God look like? I just know that he's glorious. What does God look like? All I know is that he's bigger than my imagination. How big is God? As big as his glory. I mean, glory is the only description that you can really use to describe the one who created us, to describe the one that made this entire universe, the one that woke you up this morning, 
the one that caused you to have the job that you have that puts money in your pocket and in your bank account, that allows you to have the family that you have, that allows you to be in good health this day. God is described by his glory. And where is this throne that our glorious God sits on? Well, this throne is located in heaven. Heaven is the only place big enough to contain the God that does all things well. Heaven is the abode of God. And when we think about heaven, we understand that heaven is the place of sinlessness. This is why we strive to go there. See, down here, we deal with depravity. We deal with foolishness. We deal with ignorance. We deal with sinfulness. But the reason why we are living right down here is because we pray that when we close our eyes for the last time, we will open up our eyes, not in hell, but in heaven. Because what makes heaven so wonderful is that it is a place where there's no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, and no more sin. My friends, heaven is a place of eternity. Heaven does not run out of resources. Notice that when Thanos snapped his fingers, 50% of heaven didn't go away. Why? Because heaven has unlimited resources. We have to understand that heaven is a place of absolute heaven, happiness and absolute power. God does not get outvoted in heaven. Heaven is a place where there is happiness, where there is joy. Why? Because as we've been studying on Wednesday night, it's a place where everybody is humble and everybody is holy. And if everybody is humble and everybody is holy, then there can be absolute happiness. You want to be happy? Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and live a holy and consecrated life and you will always have a smile on your face. Even when the day is bad, you still have joy. Why? Because after all the things you've been through, God is still good and we can't wait to go to a place where there is absolute happiness and absolute power. My brothers and sisters, it is in heaven that Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, speaks of a door, a door standing open. When you look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it talks about that the reason why John was able to see this throne is because there was a door standing open. This door, my brothers and sisters, was a door of observation. Notice that in Acts chapter 7, the Bible tells us that Stephen looked through this same door. In Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 56, where the Bible reads, But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Notice that John looks through the same door and John sees the same thing. Through it, he got a glimpse of God's glory. And this text has always amazed me. And it has amazed me not only because these are the words of God and what John laid his eyes on, but it's because of all these books and all these testimonies of people that look like you and I living today that says that they've been to this place that John says he saw and how they never see the same things. Stephen saw what John saw. John saw what Stephen saw. But people living in Tucson didn't see what Stephen and John saw. So who are we to believe? Are we to believe Stephen and John? Or are we to believe? these lying individuals living in the 21st century. It's amazing how individuals say that they've opened, they've seen heaven, how they've even been to heaven. Yet in all these books that have been written and in all these interviews that have been conducted, they talk about everything except the throne of God. How you been to heaven and hadn't even seen the throne? 
How you been to heaven, had the doors open to heaven and haven't even seen the one sitting on the throne? They never talk about the one sitting on the throne. They never talk about the one seated on the throne. They don't even talk about the one standing and sitting at the right hand of the throne. They talk about other things that they've seen and heard. They talk about a bright light. They talk about loved ones who have passed away. They talk about words of encouragement that they've received that God gave to them to tell the other people so that they can make a financial profit. They talk about all the things that they were told to talk about. They talk about all the things that they've seen in heaven, but they never say anything about seeing the throne of God. If they, talk, if they can talk about these things, about the things that they have seen and the things that they have heard, then I want you to know this morning that what they saw was not heaven. For the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul writes, And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But God knows, and he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. So if man can talk about it, then it wasn't what he thought he was, what he was seeing. Because if it can be described, then you didn't see it. It wasn't heaven. It may have been your holy imagination. It may have been something you've seen in a movie. It may have been a picture that your kid drew and you kept remembering it because it was on your refrigerator and therefore you subconsciously have come to the conclusion that maybe this is the glory of God. But if you can describe it, you didn't see it. This is further evidence that the book of Revelation is written in apocalyptic literature. There is symbolism in this book which both conceals, but at the same time as it is concealing, it is also revealing. It's concealing the message from the enemy of God, but it's also at the same time revealing the message to the people of God. Let us consider what John saw in Revelation chapter 4 to get a better understanding, number one, of the sovereignty of God, number two, why we are to be a people of hope today, and number three, what is it that we're supposed to look forward to on tomorrow? Point number one is found in Revelation chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, the Bible reads, beginning with verse 2, he says, At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and round the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Our first point this morning is to talk about the nature of God's throne. I believe a lot of people do not stand before the throne and bend their knee before the throne and do not honor the one sitting on the throne because they don't understand the nature of the throne. It's very hard for us as Americans to really understand the nature of a throne. We get fascinated with the sovereignty in a place called the United Kingdom in which that is a monarchy in which there is absolutely no power in that monarchy. And be us being in America, we have a president. We get to decide who becomes the executive leader of this country. And we do not call that man or that individual a king because we live under a democratic republic. And so therefore, we really miss the concept as to what it means to really be under a divine, benevolent, merciful monarchy. This is why when things don't go our way, we always got something to say. Try that under a monarchy. You don't get to speak against the king. You don't get to speak against his decrees. And this is why we have a lot of problem in the church today. It's because people feel that their voice matters. Your voice does not matter in the presence of the king. He will hear your cry, 
He will hear your needs and he'll take care of your needs because he's good. But if you don't like his law, you're just wasting your breath because he's perfect. He knows what he's doing. And if we want to live, if we don't want to be judged, and on the last day, if we don't want to be executed, then we just simply need to obey the voice of the king, the one that is seated on the throne. See, the nature of God's throne is eternal. The apostle John uses stones to describe the appearance of God in his throne. The thrones, the stones rather, that he uses are symbolic of specific attributes of God, which never fade away. So if we can understand these colors, if we can understand these stones, then we are given a description of the attributes of God, and these attributes will never go away. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible reads, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper. Jasper is a stone of sparkling whiteness to describe the radiance of God. But at the same time, it's crystal clear. See, Jasper is the stone used to describe the holiness of God's throne. See, the Bible shares with us that God is everlasting. There's no end to God. He is alpha and omega, beginning and the end. Nothing came before God and nothing will come after God. He is beyond what Buzz Lightyear said when he says, and to infinity and beyond. That's speaking forward of God. But God is also negative infinity as well. Nothing came before him. Nothing will ever come after him. He is everlasting. Listen to your Bible in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40. And the verse is 28. The Bible reads, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord, that Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. That's the one who is sitting on the throne. If you're crying at night and your pillow has become tears, there is somebody who is still up that even when you're tired, he's not tired. And he'll hear your cries because the one sitting on the throne, he doesn't get tired. He doesn't grow weary. And there isn't a question that you can ask him that he doesn't know the answer to because his understanding is unsearchable. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. You can try to run from God if you want to. He'll always find you because every place you hide, he has already created that as a hiding place for the purposes of finding you wherever you think you can hide from him from. He's that everlasting. And Jasper describes that of him. Not only is that, he is holy. Listen to your Bible. In Psalm 99, verse 9, the Bible reads, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. If God is everlasting and if God is holy and he is, then that means that his holiness is eternal. That means that the God we serve will always be morally pure. He will always do the right thing and never do the wrong thing. God is still on the throne. Therefore, his holiness nor his authority will ever fade away. You can trust God to do the right thing the right way for the right reasons not some of the time but all the time whether you like what he is doing for you or not it will always be right and it will never run out in Revelation chapter 4 verse 3 the appearance of God was also like carnelian carnelian is the same as sardius carnelian is a stone of a fiery red color 
used to explain the terror of God's wrath. Carnelian is a stone used to describe the justice of God's throne. So not only is he holy, he's also just. See, justice is God giving us what we do deserve. See, our God is a just God. And not only is he a just God and his holiness is eternal, but his justice is eternal. There is no statute of limitations with God. If you sinned in 1980 and you refuse to repent of that sin, it doesn't matter if judgment comes April 29th, 2024, you can't say to God, well, that was 44 years ago. If you didn't make it right, God, don't forget. But if you come to God in humble obedience, apply the prescription, which is the blood of Jesus that was shed to wash away your sin. Even Satan will show up and remember all the dirt you've ever done. But if you make things right with God, God will take your sins, cast it in the sea of forgetfulness, and remember it no more. Because God is just like that. Listen to your Bible. In Psalm 89, verse 14. Psalm 89, verse 14, the Bible reads, Righteousness and justice. They're the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. If God is everlasting and if God is just, then his justice is eternal. God will always execute righteous judgments. That means every penalty owed to him will always be paid. God is still on the throne and his justice nor his power will ever fade away. Also in Revelation chapter 4 verse 3, the Bible reads, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Emerald is a stone of green color, which is a soft, mild, restful color, symbolic of God's mercy. So not only is God holy, not only is God just, but God is also at the same time merciful. The rainbow, which had this color, is a reminder to us of the sin that destroyed the world, but also the calm after the storm in Genesis chapter 9, verses 12 through 17. Most importantly, it is to remind us of the faithfulness and hope of God's promises. That means that if God said it, he will do it. And can I say, won't he do it? The emerald green rainbow is used to describe the mercy of God's throne. Mercy is unlike justice. Where justice is God giving us what we do deserve, mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. See, our God is merciful and his mercy is everlasting. Listen to your Bible. In Psalm 100, verse 5, Psalm 100, verse 5, and I like the way the King James Version reads. In Psalm 105, Psalm 100, verse 5, the Bible reads, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations so if God is everlasting and his mercy is everlasting then he will always be merciful towards us for as long as he reigns supreme God is still on the throne therefore his mercy nor his dominion will ever fade away the throne of God is a throne of holiness. It's a throne of justice. It's a throne of mercy. All of which are eternal and combined in God. If we can remember that God is eternal, then we know that God will not change for us, but we must change for God. God is holy. He is always right and never wrong. So it is in our best interest never to disagree with his will for our lives. God is just. 
He imposes a penalty for our unrighteousness. So it would be prudent of us to stay away from sin, knowing we are unable to pay this penalty in and of ourselves. God is merciful. His steadfast love for us causes him to pause and to take notice of us and provide a way of redemption for us. Now, that's just the first three verses of Revelation chapter 4. But I want us to take a look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, as we move on to our second point. Because just like we talked about the nature of God's throne, it's very important that we also talk about the surroundings around God's throne. What is it that is surrounding the throne of God? Well, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible reads, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. The Bible says around God's throne was 24 elders. We're just 20 short here at Northside. Okay, a few of you got that. All right, amen. Somebody's paying attention. All right. But around God's throne, there was 24 elders. The combination of the number 24 and the designation of the term elders makes clear who these 24 elders represent. God's covenant people in the Old Testament started with the 12 sons of Jacob. God's covenant people in the New Testament started with the 12 apostles. These men ushered in the foundation of God's plan for saving man. Now, I need the young people to back me on this. I believe 12 plus 12 equals 24. Am I right? Young people, am I right? See, some people say, I don't talk to young people. I'm talking to young people now. Thank you very much. 12 plus 12 is 24. Therefore, these elders represent what is known as the redeemed of all ages. So when John saw this door open, he saw the redeemed sitting on thrones, and they were wearing white garments and golden crowns. Now, these thrones are symbolic of our royalty. Sometimes we forget that the one who is sitting on the throne, we are his children if we have responded to the call of Jesus Christ. We are not only heirs of God, but we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So if God is king and you are sister in Christ, that makes you a princess, your royalty. And if I am a male and if you are a male, that makes us princes if we are sons of the king. We're children of God. And Peter reiterates this when we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to your Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible reads, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that's what the thrones represent. It represents our royalty. But the people that were sitting on the thrones were also wearing white garments. The white garments are symbolic of our purity. Listen to your Bible. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible reads, Revelation chapter 3, verse 4, Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. So not only are the redeemed supposed to be royal and pure, but they are wearing crowns of gold, which is symbolic of our victory. Listen to your Bible. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, the apostle Paul, in writing his 
final words, his farewell message to the young preacher Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all that have loved his appearance. My brothers and sisters, if we take seriously his everlasting holiness, his everlasting justice, his everlasting mercy, then we can be numbered among the redeemed. And this requires that we remain faithful to Christ and overcome the enemy by God's strength and God's strength alone. My friends, if we can endure to the end, then we will reign with Christ. We will walk with Christ and we will have victory in Christ Jesus. But notice that these 24 elders weren't the only ones surrounding the throne. There wasn't just 24 thrones surrounding the throne. It wasn't just these elders clothed in white, wearing golden crowns, surrounded around the throne. What else was surrounding the throne and what does it mean? Well, you're going to have to come back tonight to find that out. So where do you stand? Where do you stand? We're all going to stand before the throne of God. As a matter of fact, you're standing before the throne right now. But the question you have to ask yourself is, do I feel good in standing before this throne? Because everybody that stands before the throne it's not going to be judged worthy by the one who is sitting on the throne. See, because the one sitting on the throne, he judges in holiness. And when he looks at us, either he's going to respond in justice or he's going to respond in mercy. So if you have yet to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, then a holy God is going to judge you in justice and give you what you do deserve. But if you would just simply respond to the gospel call today, this holy God who judges in holiness will look upon you, see the blood of his son covering you, and he will judge you in mercy and not give you what you do deserve. But he will respond in grace and give you what you don't deserve. And that is to be at home with him forevermore. God is still holy. The question is, do you want his justice or do you want his mercy? because he has enough to dish out on this entire world, both living, dead, and those that haven't even been thought of yet. But if you're under the sound of my voice and you're yet to respond to the gospel call, this is your opportunity to believe that Jesus is the answer, that this holy God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to die not only for us but for everybody and all he asks is that when you come before his glory that you see your own sinfulness and you see your own self-perceived righteousness for what it really is filthy rags and repent before the glory of a holy God Will you confess Jesus Christ, his son, his Messiah, his chosen one, to be the son of the living God on today? And will you have your sins washed away? Though your sins be as scarlet in the waters of baptism, when you make contact with the blood of Jesus, he knows how to make you white as snow so that you can be, when Jesus comes again, around that throne, sitting on a throne, wearing a crown of victory because your garments are white. 
And once you respond to the gospel call, he stands ready to clean you, to forgive you of your sins, to make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. What kind of creature? A creature that has been bought back, a creature that is now redeemed. And because you have been redeemed, according to Psalm 107, you can now go out here and say so. And God will add you to his church, the only church that you can read about in the Bible. And that church is the church of Christ. That's the church that the 12 apostles were the foundation of. That's the church that the apostles preached in. The apostles know nothing about a Baptist church. Why? Because when they was preaching salvation, there was no such thing as a Baptist church. They don't know nothing about a Catholic church. You know why? Because while they was preaching salvation, there was no such thing as a Catholic church. They don't know nothing about all these denominations that are out in the world today. You know why? Because while these men was preaching Christ and him crucified and bringing salvation to a lost and dying world, none of these churches existed then except for the one that Jesus built and it bears his name. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Romans chapter 16, verse 16. So why not become a member of a going church for a coming Lord, which does all that God authorizes? And maybe you are a Christian on today. Maybe you've already obeyed the gospel. But maybe you've allowed your garments like the people in Sardis to be soiled with sin. Maybe you are walking around here depressed and defeated, not thinking that you have the victory when God has a crown waiting for you. Maybe you're walking around here pessimistic and with an attitude all the time, thinking that you're a nobody when by the very existence that you're in Christ, he has made you somebody and can cause you to sit on a throne. Maybe you don't recognize your own royalty and that's why you walk around here like a peasant. Maybe you don't recognize the purity and the price that Jesus paid to keep you clean and therefore you out here like a sow wallowing in the mire once again. Maybe you have forgotten that you have the victory. I was talking to a friend yesterday. He said while he was in school he was making bad grades in chemistry. And so he got so discouraged he dropped the class. And the professor says, why did you drop this class? He says, because I pretty much failed every test that I took. He says, well, you had a B in the class. He said, I graded on the curve. Now, my friend had to take the class all over again. <laughs> so the, here's the thing. Maybe you walking around here thinking that you failing. But you fail to realize that the one sitting on the throne. <laughs> He's judging you on a curve. And that curve is Jesus Christ. You've been washed in his blood. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't quit. Just keep holding on to his hand. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep trusting in the one who died for you. And he'll get you to where you ought to be. Just don't give up. And so this is your opportunity to say, I thought about quitting. My mind was going in the wrong direction. I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing. Renew your covenant with God. Because again, God still judges in holiness. And even though you've done what you needed to do to be judged in mercy, if you start, stop living a holy and consecrated life and start going back out into the world and start living in pretense and in hypocrisy, you no longer humbling yourself. You're no longer living holy. You're trying to find a means of happiness outside of doing what God has commanded you to do. Then that's what God would do. He will no longer judge you in mercy. He will judge you in justice and give you exactly what you deserve. And that's not what you want. For once in my life, I don't want what I deserve. I want what I don't deserve. And God is ready to give it to you if you would just simply make things right with him before it's eternally and everlasting too late. We're about to sing a song, and that song is entitled, Is It For Me? Yes, it, for, yes, it is for you, but you got to do something to receive it. The question is, do you want it? 
If you want it, make a wise-hearted decision.